In this video, we're diving into an astonishing story. How Ukraine managed to shoot down 11 Russian aircraft in just 11 days, dealing a significant blow to Russia's already struggling air campaign. But what does this mean in the larger context of the air war as of March 2024? What are the risks and challenges both sides are now facing? We'll spotlight the downing of eight Su-34s, two Su-35s, and notably one Beriev A-50 radar plane, a particularly rare and notable achievement. But how did Ukraine pull off this impressive feat, especially against the Beriev A-50, and what impact has this had on the tactics and morale of both the Ukrainian and Russian forces? Stay with us as we unpack these critical moments and their implications in the ongoing conflict. The Beriev A-50, akin to America's E-3 Sentry, plays a crucial role as an airborne early warning and control AWACS aircraft. These AWACS planes are vital for command, communications, and control within a war zone's airspace. But what specific functions have these planes served in the Ukrainian conflict? Well, Russia's AWACS planes have helped to detect incoming missiles and connect troops on the front line with their headquarters, which are usually hundreds of miles away. The comms link provided by the A-50 has magnified in importance after Russia needed to move such headquarters further back from the line to guard against HIMARS attacks. Each A-50 comes with a crew of up to 15 men. However, a video released on February 23rd seemed to show the wreckage of an A-50 in the Russian territory of Krasnodar Krai, east of the Sea of Azov. The loss was in fact the second loss of an A-50 plane this year, following on the heels of an incident in January. Ukrainian sources claim that five majors, three captains, a lieutenant, and a sergeant major were killed in the attack. The loss of experienced airmen like these is as big a blow to the Russian aerospace forces as the loss of the aircraft itself. But how did Ukraine manage such a precise and impactful strike? It appears that the January incident was executed using one of Ukraine's Patriot missile batteries. Russia has guarded its A-50 planes from Ukrainian air defenses by typically deploying them outside the 75-mile range of the S-300 air defense system, which Ukraine has in good numbers. Unfortunately for the Kremlin, the Patriot with its Pac-2 missile has a 90-mile range, and the Russian brass seems not to have expected Ukraine to use its newer air defense systems in this way. Here's the interesting part, though. The February incident might have involved an S-200 air defense system from the Cold War. The A-50 targeted in that incident was positioned at least 120 miles away from the front lines, a distance beyond the reach of the Pac-2 missile. This leads to a crucial question. What enabled the Ukrainians to strike at such a distance? It turns out the Soviet-era S-200's 5V-28 missile was the key, possessing the necessary range to make this strike possible. Before the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine had about 16 S-200 systems spread across the country, Initially, with the war's outbreak, Ukraine brought some of these systems out of storage, using them mainly against ground targets, including targets within Russian territory. Now it appears Ukraine is employing the S-200 for its intended purpose, aerial defense. But what challenges has Ukraine faced in adapting these Soviet-era systems to modern warfare? The S-200, while a powerful system, has its drawbacks when compared to the Patriot. It's far less accurate, and the 5V-28 missile is heavy at 8 tons, including a 500-pound warhead, making it difficult to transport. However, the Ukrainians seem to have improved its accuracy with small GPS seekers installed in place of the traditional guidance system. Against a target with a lack of maneuverability like the A-50, this seems to be more than enough. To make matters worse for the Russian aerospace forces, Ukraine might have as many as 1,000 5V-28 missiles in its arsenal and have assistance from the Poles to maintain the chemicals needed to propel them. A third A-50 was damaged in a drone strike last year. The loss of these planes is a heavy blow to Russia's air force. Only about 40 A-50s were ever made, and Russia had only nine modernized A-50s available before the start of the war. It now has just seven, and only six are operational. Russian industry is now scrambling to replace the lost planes, but this will come at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. Russia has also been trying to field the A-50's successor, the A-100, but there is only one of these, and sanctions mean that it will be more difficult for Russia to get its hands on the electronics this plane needs to operate. In the meantime, Russia's ability to control the skies over Ukraine, particularly in the south around the all-important Crimea, has weakened. Ukraine's destruction of the A-50s flying near its airspace has eliminated about a third of the sensor coverage that Russia's air fleet can create. This results in a lack of information that could make other planes vulnerable. 
Crimea has also been put at elevated risk in another way. Raids last year knocked out some of the ground-based radars on the peninsula. Russia turned to the A-50 to plug the gap. The loss of the two A-50s make Crimea even more prone to drone and missile attacks, which have already forced the Russian Black Sea Fleet to retreat from Sevastopol, its traditional base. Russia will therefore have good reason to keep its AWACS aircraft even further back from the front, harming C&C &C and making Russian forces less adaptable, particularly with their top-heavy command structure, which discourages initiative in junior officers. You can expect more drone and missile strikes on Crimea and other targets of opportunity as Russia's eyes in the sky grow less capable. Russia had once counted on its A-50s to cover three broad areas in the south, east and north to extend sensor coverage across the entire front in eastern Ukraine. Each of these three areas would have three A-50s on coverage. But what happens now when one of these planes has been damaged and two destroyed? It seems Putin is steadily losing his ability to cover the front. Ukraine's successes in downing these Russian planes has effectively multiplied its forces' combat effectiveness, facilitating easier targeting of other Russian aircraft and enabling surprise attacks on ground positions. This brings up a crucial point. How has Ukraine been adapting and using other air defense systems, not just for defense but also as offensive tools? Alongside these strikes, Ukraine has been creatively employing its NASAM systems, which are likely contributing to the recent downing of additional Russian aircraft. NASAMs are equipped with missiles like the AIM-9X Sidewinder and the AIM-120 AMRAAM, typically found on fighter jets. Increasingly, around February 26, Russian forces destroyed one of Ukraine's NASAMs near Zaporizhia, indicating that these systems might be deployed closer to the front lines for offensive operations against Russian aircraft. NASAMS also has interoperability with the longer-range Patriot system, allowing for greater coverage against varieties of targets at different ranges and altitudes. With its Raytheon MPQ-64F1 Sentinel radar, it has 360-degree coverage and can track and acquire targets at ranges of up to 75 miles. The NASAM-2's AMRAAM missile has an effective range of about 48 miles. The NASAM-3's AMRAAM range goes further, up to about 80 miles. The Patriots Pac-2's 90-mile range reinforces these operations if the two systems are used in conjunction. Both systems are probably being used as part of a mobile air defense strategy, being moved to hotspots along the front line in response to increased Russian sorties and then quickly moving away to avoid a retaliatory response from the Russian Air Force. Because the Patriot and NASAMs are mobile, they can move in and out as needed, although multiple vehicles will be needed for this making the operation riskier should the Russians have good intelligence on where these systems will be deployed. But if Ukrainian forces are taking risks in the way they've begun to use these systems, the Russian forces are taking additional risks of their own, and the increased downing of Russian aircraft in recent days has as much to do with a shift in Russian strategy as it does a mobile, adaptable use of air defense systems by the Ukrainian troops near the front. After the fall of Avdivka in February 2024, Ukraine's situation became increasingly dire, with a noticeable shortage of ammunition. This development has emboldened Russian ground forces, and consequently, their air force has begun flying more sorties closer to the front lines than ever before. But what does this change in Russian tactics reveal about their strategy and confidence in the air? Throughout most of the conflict, Russia has been cautious about risking aircraft losses. Notably, it has refrained from deploying its latest fifth-generation Su-57 Felon fighter jet over Ukrainian airspace. However, Russia's attitude in the deployment of its air force is now starting to change. According to Ukraine's Center for Defense Strategies think tank, the enemy has overcome the fear of using aviation directly over the battlefield, and although this results in the loss of aircraft, their ground forces gain a significant firepower advantage. CDS reports that Russia is increasingly utilizing aircraft to support operations on various fronts, including in the areas around the villages of Ivanivska, Bodanivka, and Hiryevka in Donetsk Oblast. These operations involve the use of guided bombs from aircraft, helicopters, and heavy artillery, assisting in the movement of armored vehicles, some recently relocated from Avdivka. Vuladar, a small city in Donetsk Oblast, which has been a target of multiple unsuccessful Russian offensives, is witnessing intensified attacks, with additional troops deployed from Avdivka. In these regions, especially from the east and northeast, Russian forces are now receiving more substantial air support than before. This strategy has led to the capture of the village of Popida and has potentially opened the road to Vuladar, a development that merits close observation in the upcoming weeks. 
These shifts suggest a significant change in tactics on the Donbass front. Russian tanks and infantry, which had previously operated with limited air support, are now receiving more coordinated aerial backing in their offensive maneuvers. The increasing use of Russian aircraft closer to the battlefield opens a new branch in the ongoing war of attrition. How much damage can Russia's air force take in exchange for the gains the increased air support will give to Moscow's war effort? On paper, Russia should be able to take the punishment more than Ukraine. Before the war, it had the world's second largest number of combat aircraft between its military branches, with 4,182. Of these, about 900 were tactical aircraft. However, Russia cannot easily replace its losses in aircraft because of the sanctions imposed on it by technology-rich countries. Although Russia has adapted to sanctions and is producing vehicles and drones at what appears to be an adequate rate, this does not appear to be the case with aircraft. As of now, production rates in Russia amount to perhaps two dozen new planes per year, according to David Axe of Forbes. One of the examples outlined in the report is with the fourth-generation Su-34 fighter jet. Russia had about 140 of these before the war, but has since lost 31. 109 thus remain. Russia cannot make up for these losses with its current production rates. Meanwhile, the new aircraft Russia can produce will likely have inferior systems due to the sanctions. The Oryx blog can provide some more details about the state of the air war. Oryx counts only visually confirmed losses, but it provides a reasonably accurate estimate of the overall situation. According to it, Russia has lost a total of 105 aircraft throughout the war as of March 2024, with 97 of them being destroyed and 8 damaged. In addition to the Su-34 fighters it has lost, Russia has lost 31 Su-25 close support aircraft, 14 Su-24 type aircraft, and 7 Su-35 fighter aircraft. The Su-35 is supposed to be Russia's most advanced fighter other than the Su-57. Aside from these, Russia has lost a pair of two 22M3 strategic bombers, with one destroyed and one damaged on the ground. One 295MS strategic bomber has also been damaged on the ground. Six Il-76 transport aircraft have become casualties with three destroyed, two damaged beyond repair, and one damaged on the ground. One AN-26 transport was destroyed in a non-combat-related incident. Three Il-22 airborne command posts have suffered as well, with one destroyed, one damaged beyond repair, and one damaged. Not only are these lost aircraft difficult to repair and replace, their inability to take to the skies puts additional pressure on Russia's existing aircraft. Fewer planes need to take on more responsibilities. Increasing the wear and tear on their airframes, demand for dwindling spare parts, and fatigue on Russian pilots and crew chiefs. In a RAND Corporation report from August 2023, Michael Bonnet, a mechanical engineer working for the think tank, estimated that the extra hours the conflict has demanded on its aircraft has effectively cost Russia an additional 27 to 57 imputed plane losses. Aircraft have a lifespan. They are designed with a total number of expected flight hours, which are used roughly evenly over the life of the aircraft and segmented with periodic maintenance and inspection. For example, if an aircraft is designed for 3,000 flight hours with an expected use of 30 years, the aircraft will fly roughly 100 hours per year. If, during an inspection, wear on the plane is found to be more or less than expected, the projected remaining hours are adjusted accordingly. These numbers dictate all sorts of planning, from fuel procurement to ground maintenance to pilot training. Imputed losses means that the Russians have burned through more of the expected lifespan of their aircraft more quickly than anticipated. To make up for it, they'll have to procure more aircraft, increase maintenance, reduce operations, or accept a smaller force or some combination of those. Even in the early stages of the war, when the Russian Air Force was more cautious and at the height of its power, it was flying between 150 and 300 sorties per day, compared to the peacetime rate of about 60. Although Russia had decreased its sorties by becoming even more cautious in the face of unexpected Ukrainian resistance, it still flew about 100 sorties a day at the low mark. Now that number is increasing again, and the burden is concentrated on fewer aircraft. In August 2023, Bonnet predicted that by the summer of 2024, the Russian Air Force would be below 75% of its pre-war strength due to the aircraft lost in combat or depletion through additional wear and tear. Bonnet says that the Russian aerospace forces will need to either increase production, reduce usage, or reduce force structure for the next 30 years to make up for these losses, although he did note that the Russian Air Force was not in a horrible position despite the casualties.
David Axe concludes that because of the increased wear and tear and the depletion of spare parts to keep planes in repair, the Russian Air Force might be down to about 700 effective combat aircraft. For now, Russia has the mass to sustain these losses, but soon it might have no choice but to become more cautious about deploying its aircraft into combat on the front again. The Ukrainians have another card to play which should arrive on the battlefield this year. In August 2023, Ukraine finally got approval to use F-16 fighter jets, which it had desired since the beginning of the war. The initial delivery was slated for 42 planes, but it is possible that Ukraine could get over 60 F-16s. These F-16s will be faster and have better radar than the original F-16 from the early 1980s, and they will be a big improvement compared to the Soviet-era MiG-29 Ukraine currently operates as its standard aircraft. However, there is another big problem for Ukraine as training the pilots and delivering the plane has taken precious time and not all of the F-16s will arrive at once. Twelve Ukrainian pilots are currently being taught to fly the F-16 in the United States. They are based at Morris Air National Guard Base in Tucson, Arizona, where their training started last October. The Arizona National Guard expects the pilots to graduate between May and August. Ukrainian pilots are also being trained in the United Kingdom, Denmark and Romania. But while the pilots may be nearing the end of their training, there is still no word on when they and their planes will arrive on the battlefield. In February, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said that it would be impossible to say when exactly the F-16s would arrive because the planes not only need well-trained pilots but the support crews and systems to keep them combat ready. Denmark's Defense Ministry said in January that the first six of the 19 F-16s it's donated to Ukraine would arrive there sometime in the second quarter of 2022. Yuri Inat, a press official for Ukraine's Air Force, said that the six pilots for those planes would be ready by spring. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitro Kaleba only confirmed that the F-16 will arrive into the war-torn country sometime later this year. According to him, 150 F-16s would be enough to secure Ukrainian airspace. So what do you think? Will the Ukrainians be able to defend their line against Russian air sorties before the F-16 arrives? Let us know in the comments. Now go and check out why Russia is afraid of F-16s in Ukraine or click this other video instead. And make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.